Yeah. Okay, good morning, everybody. I guess we'll we'll get this show started. Um, where should I be for them? Does it matter? You're good. Okay. Yep. Um, great. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the April Green Custody Workshop. Um, I'm Abby Finnis. I'm with Great Plains. Uh, last year, I think I ran nearly all of these, and this year we've had a team effort, which has been really great. And so um, we've had we've had a different mix of Green City folks running the the work that we've been here, but it's it's good to see back. And um, yeah, it's just like riding a bicycle, so all of this is just fine. Um, so we're gonna start with a round of introductions, and then we're gonna the the topic today is thinking about smart cities and um, the emergence of technology. Better. Yep, there you go. <laughs> yes, it's back. Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, so we're just doing a little introductions and uh, icebreaker around uh, what, what smart city means to us. So that allowed everybody a little bit of extra time to think about that. So, Kristen. Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Morello. I'm with the Environmental Quality Board and the Local Government Coordinator, and I get to help Abby and um, fill up in the others listening stuff. Cities and Travel Nation. Smart City. I was really hoping you'd start in the back. <laughs> um, I think just, I mean, it's, it's a form of efficiency. These are our LMC staffers. <laughs> I'm yeah. Bill here with Ellen. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Jeff. Great. Yeah. And we really appreciate the technical support. For sure. Today. Thank you. Yeah, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Laura Mollis. I'm with Siemens with our Smart Infrastructure and Distributed Energy Systems Group. And um, you'll hear a lot from me in a little bit. So I'll try and just use one word. Um, and be smart. Yeah. <laughs> Smart. Um, Smart, yeah. Optimized. Uh, I'm Allison Simpson. I also work with Laura at Siemens. I am their new IoT specialist. Um, I have been in the lighting industry for about eight years. What is IoT? Um, Internet of Things. I'm sure you guys have heard the buzz about it. But to me, a smart um, city, smart building, smart lighting, all that stuff. There are sensors everywhere. Sensors telling you how your city is operating. All right, uh, Philip Music uh, with the Green Subsidies Program, uh, MPCA. Uh, information and data, lots of data, lots of data giving us more information. That's what I think of when I think of the smart city. Um, Paul Drodos, uh, City Red Wing, and um, I think of uh, no pedestrian deaths or accidents. Uh, years ago, I was actually hit by a vehicle, and um, it's, it's kind of a lingering memory, a good good result. But um, so our, our city does has um, looked into complete streets, so we've, we've taken that a little forward. But I, I think in a really safe city, I, I don't think uh, vehicles or anything should be able to run into pedestrians or bicyclists. Melissa Bartman with the City of Red Wing, and I think of intuitive and efficient. Julie Moore with the City of Shorewood, and I would say active and fresh. Jeff Buchanan uh, with the City Council, and I think of efficient and I also think of climate change. Julie Ellen, and I'm with industry, and I think of engaged. Ben Wallace with uh, Link Positive. I do energy and sustainability consulting for the dev. Um, just IoT smart building space for so 75F. Um, I would say smart build in some smart building are uh, smart city enablement as well. I would say um, informed, connected, and facilitating or having calm compute. I think to your point earlier, that a lot of things are just working in the background, uh, sensing, connected. <laughs> okay. 
big laugh. It's hard to uh, come up with a new word. Uh, I was going to say insight. Uh, so, by the way, my name is Murray Amin. I'm the business development director at Energy Sprint. And I'll provide the back to you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Do you want to have everyone online come here? Well, yeah, if anybody has any, yeah. We have a number of folks online. Um, I don't know the most organized way to do it, but if anybody wants to. You can just see them when they comment up there. Oh, are there any comments? There. Where are you from <laughs> and what's your word? Logistically, there's a there's like a little chat box in your, in your GoToMeeting, so if you have any comments or questions, you can enter them into there. Can you raise your hand on GoTo? No, you can't do that. Um, uh, so, if anybody has anything, that, any words or anything that comes to mind online, feel free to share them in the in the chat box as well, um, and that we can share them with the rest of the room. Justin Fair. I like that I can see it up there. It's yeah, not all the time. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, Great. Well, so we're going to have a couple of presentations, one from Laura Mowitz with Siemens, and then um, Blake Redfield with the City of St. Cloud is going to talk about a smart street lighting project that the city has done up there. Um, but first, we'll do a little bit of introduction. We kind of, we said kind of these words, right? And these are the things that come to mind uh, when we think about smart city <laughs> technology. Um, I've been to a few presentations at conferences on smart city, and, and there are a number of really cool things that cities are doing around the world. Um, my impression is that India might be one of the, the places where cities are leading the way um, on integrating these technologies. I think oftentimes we see them as isolated. You know, it might be street lighting or it might be building automation or it might be kind of here or there. Um, but uh, we haven't quite hit the place, I think, where it's been fully integrated across the city. Um, at least not in Minnesota that I'm aware of. Um, and so, and so what does that look like and, and what are what are some exciting things that are coming in from it and what are some things that are reason to take pause and, and, and concern around, you know, what is too much data or, you know, what are we going to do with that data and are there privacy concerns or, you know, how do we weigh the benefits with, with some, some concerns that folks might have around um, around these, these uh, different technologies. And so I just sort of put you know, what kind of came to mind um, as I was thinking about smart cities up here uh, and, and thinking about where all uh, this technology can fit into. And obviously this is not the full list. Um, there are many, many more things behind this. Um, but then thinking about, you know, which of our best practices do they fit into? They probably fit into all of them, but these were the ones that seemed the most obvious to me, which is quite a number of our best practices. and. Um, we don't have really smart city. We have a little bit of smart grid in our best practice actions, and we have smart growth, which is you know, smart, but it's not it's not what we're talking about exactly here um, in the same way. And so there's a lot of room, I think, for um, considering our approach to best practices or approach to approach these actions to um, think about, you know, how do we how do we consider the technology in this framework, in this context, um, so that you know you don't you can you can do things the smart way, I guess, from from the get-go rather than um, trying to retrofit too much. Because I think right now, especially as cities are converting, Philip mentioned today that there was an article in the Search Review and talking about um, the LED conversion that's going on in Minneapolis right now, where we're just basically going through every single street, we're taking out the streets and we're putting in um, new LED fixtures, but they're not necessarily coming with the technology that they could be coming with. Um, and so what does that mean from the city's standpoint or Excel Energy standpoint of then going back and, and integrating technology um, versus kind of doing it upfront and deciding what you want and um, beyond just collecting data, but you know, we, we can have conservation and I hope I'm not getting into it too much, but you know, we can have conservation by, you know, the lights don't need to be on if nobody's there, right? And so, um, so thinking about all of these, these different aspects and, and integrating and incorporating them um, into what we do. And so, um, in short, there's a lot of room in green subsidies to think through this, and we're going to kind of focus more broadly with Laura, and then we'll come back to, to the more specifically streetlights with um, Blake. And Blake is uh, 
is going to be remoting or, or presenting remotely from St. Cloud. And so, um, so uh, we've done it once before and it was successful. And so I think that I think it'll work out great. So Blake, we'll hear from you in a little bit. And first up, we'll have Laura. So, Abby, would you just comment on India, why you thought India? I'm just curious. Um, so, uh, I went to the National APA conference last year, and a big focus area was, um, that's the American Planning Association conference, um, was, was on smart cities, and a number of the presentations were from India, and there were, um, the, the federal government has given a lot of money to <laughs> local governments to, like, clean up and get smart and kind of uh, uh, figure things out. And there was one government in particular that really embraced the idea of smart cities. And they went from the most polluted, kind of the worst place to live in India to one of the best places to live from about like 1990 something to the present day. And so it was just like this major transformation um, that seemed to really integrate different aspects of, of smart cities. And I think that's a really great um, kind of transition is, you know, what are these kind of global trends that are happening and what are the advancements that technology is allowing us to now have these conversations and communicate and learn and trade because, um, right, the world is a very connected place now. And I think probably all of us have access to the most amount of data and um, access to information in such a short amount of time. I mean, and I don't think I have to tell you that if you have a smartphone, I mean, the amount of data that is out there that is, uh, I mean, it's almost unquantifiable how much there is. But at the same time, the world is also a very stressed place. And I mean that in the form of when we look at increasing populations as well as with limited resources, um, that poses some challenges, and from a big, big perspective, what is that? You know, we're competing of finite resources as far as clean air, clean water, um, energy, and even locally, how does that impact our local cities, right? How do we make remain competitive? How do we get businesses and people to want to live in that city, have families, and build community here um, versus somewhere else? And so I think about smart cities is how can you leverage, right, all of this digitalization and use it to alleviate the stresses of these already overstretched resources and services, okay? And so I'm really interested in this um, perspective, and I guess I'm of the opinion that if we can have some type of seamless integration of all of that data, right, and it's all connected through this internet of things like Allison had pointed out, and if we can collect all that and integrate it with the city's underlying infrastructure system, we can manage this, these challenges of interest and we can optimize it. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those global trends that are, you know, why are we here? Why are we talking about smart cities and why is this so important? Um, I've got a couple examples of some smart cities because if there's one thing that you take, smart cities are built on smart buildings and they're built on smart energy, okay? It takes a lot of power to do all this. It takes electricity. Um, and if we don't have that, none of this internet of things and none of this harnessing of data is possible. Um, and so I'll talk about a couple of examples, and I have some videos, so Bill, I hope <laughs> <laughs> this is a very smart presentation, and right? we're doing remote and some videos, so hopefully it'll work. Um, and, you know, and of course the biggest restraint, I think, too, is always money, right? So what is, first of all, that vision of the future of smart cities, and how much is it going to cost, right? So how do we incrementally make investments in our cities and our communities and our infrastructure that kind of support that vision of the future? And so speaking of vision of future, I've got a video. Um, so Siemens, it, and I should also say, full disclosure, I work for a private company, I work for Siemens. So you'll see our logo on some of these videos and stuff. I'm sorry, I tried to take it off, but I'm not that video savvy. Um, so, I apologize in advance. 
for the onslaught of photos. Um, but we have done a lot, a lot of research and development. This is an incredibly um, exciting time for a company like Siemens. I don't know if um, people know this or not, but Siemens actually um, either generates or helps manage about one third of the world's energy. Okay, so one third of the world's energy. And it's also a leading technology provider, especially in the wor world of um, energy technologies and building technologies. So what happens in this sector is really, really important to us. What happens in our cities, our local cities, is really, really important to us. Um, and because of that, we've you know, made millions of research um, in R&D. And one of the things that we're looking at for future is something called the crystal. And so there's actually a building, a built building in London that has a lot of these integrated technologies and harnessing it. And it's all supporting a future that looks, I guess, kind of something like this.
um, the population is growing significantly and people are living longer, okay? Um, so when I looked at, again, U.S. Census data, if I look at the combination of birth, death, and migration levels, in the U.S. alone, our population is growing one person every 19 seconds. Okay, one person every 19 seconds. And where are all these people going to live? Right? They're going to live, majority of them are going to live in cities. Already over 50% of our population lives in cities. We're projecting that to grow um, even up to almost 70% of our population will live in cities. So when we think about smart cities, and also you all as members and leaders of cities, um, how our infrastructure supports those cities is really important. And then, of course, climate change. You know, it's posing risk that, um, you know, technology and maybe data can help navigate a path to a more resilient future. I mean, when we look at climate change, I mean, even we felt it here in Minnesota, polar vortex, right? Utilities asking us to curb our natural gas usage. That's kind of scary. Um, we're also looking at, like, climate refugee cities. I mean, I was just listening to a talk, I think it was two days ago, um, in Duluth. They were having a workshop saying Duluth has been identified as a climate refuge city. And I think they were saying already like 1.5 million people have been displaced by climate change. Where are all these people going to go? Where are they going to live? And how can we be safe harbors for some of those populations? And really, not a lot has changed. I mean, all these things are happening, right? But all the systems and the things that we put into our cities and our buildings really hasn't changed all that much, really up until about the last 10 years. You know, our energy system is just used to be just this very one directional thing where you make the energy, you send it out. And now the energy systems today are becoming a lot more integrated and connected. It's bilateral. You can make your own energy and you can sell it to your neighbor or you can send it back to the grid. You know, it's much more fluid, which opens up a lot of opportunities for clean energy and cleaner energy economy and gaining efficiency. And buildings back in the day, right? I mean, we probably still do this. You put an air handler here. You put a boiler there. Windows. Lights. Right? There are these things that are very siloed, and they're just systems. And those systems haven't really changed all that much, again, up until recently. Now buildings are being some of the most connected assets in the world. I mean, from your phone, you can turn lights on and off. You can um, have electric panels that actually tell you now what smart meters do, how much energy is being used inside a building. Because a lot of times we can tell how much energy goes to a building and then it goes to a meter, right? And then it goes to a building. We can see what's in that meter, but once it gets to the meter, we don't know what happens after that. And that's where all the energy is being displaced. And so now we've got the technology and the capabilities to do that. And making a smart building, so another concept, another futuristic concept maybe. We saw one in the city. Um, another one is of the autonomous buildings. We talk a lot about autonomous cars, um, but you know this is also the autonomous building. And so I found a little video on that too. Security needs based on transit predictive movements of its occupants or creates 
smart spaces were shaped and just with the sun shining directly in the windows. Today, buildings produce thousands upon thousands of data points each day, which literally creates a pool of data. But in fact, the most important and useful data is still only a cup. You just have to know which cup is most important. Tomorrow's buildings will be autonomous. They will always be learning, always be awake.
that gap. And um, I'll talk about the room, which you know might not be a traditional financing repertoire as of yet, but it's um, we're seeing a lot of traction with this. Um, so yeah, they call this, you know, smart city, city 4.0. This came out of manufacturing and industry. They call it industrial 4.0, when now you can use all of these um, technologies to optimize and make things faster and make them better and make them safer and reduce risk. And so here's just a fun little video, um, and it'll kind of lead into to the examples that I'll talk about. It's really quick, but it's cute. Hello, Hello. Michigan. We're pretty high-tech. Thanks to our heated sidewalk, we can bump a man's down the street year-round. Best city in the world. No. Thanks for that. You like skyscrapers? You can thank us. And our city, you can also thank us for making the country greener with these lead certified buildings. I mean, who else can say that? We can. We have everything right here in Brooklyn. We would make our own electricity and the whole block share. They don't do that, Manette. From energy to infrastructure, Siemens Digital Technology is giving cities even more to be proud of. Okay, so Holland, Michigan, right? The plug. What happened there? So um, they have a, I think it was like 1890 was when their power plant was built, and they were looking at massive amounts of investment that needed just to keep the plant running and to meet the most minimum of efficiency requirements. And the investment was so much that it made them start questioning, okay, how should we go about doing that? Right? This is so much money. Is there a better way to do this? And so they started looking at converting the coal plant, their existing coal plant, and they converted it um, using new technologies that combined heat and power, meaning it does two things at once. Okay, so it creates power that can go to the grid in the form of electricity or can go to the form of the building, the facility itself. And then it also creates heat. So what they did is then by engineering the systems and all these integrated smart systems, they said, okay, well, we can take all of the excess heat off the condensing pipe and push that through our steam throughout the city, right? So all throughout the city and it heats the sidewalks for their snow melt system. Okay, this is a big thing, especially if you are somebody who has to get around in a wheelchair or um, you have a harder time getting around or it's hard to shovel all the time. I don't know, I would have loved for this this winter. I live on a corner lot and, you know, my husband and I almost got divorced over <laughs> the amount of shoveling that got to be done. Um, but so that's a big thing and it all just, it was inspired by the fact of, hey, we've got some old stuff going on. There's new ways of doing things. We have a major investment on our hand. How can we do this better? Um, and not only that, they used the opportunity to educate their community. So they created a visitor center in the power plant. <laughs> when was the last time any of us, you know, had a tour of the power plant, right? So they created this visitor center where now you can bring your families and it's community education and saying, hey, the city of Holland, we're super committed to the future. Our vision of the future means cleaner energy, more efficient energy, more reliable energy, more affordable energy, more consistent energy, and we're putting our money where our mouths are and we're investing in that future, not just for us, but for the entire community. So it's a really great example of being able to use all these new technologies because this takes a lot of integrated systems. It takes a lot of moving pieces to kind of work together. Oh, you don't need to play this one. Okay. Um, another um, example is Bronzeville Committee Microgrid. So this is a community in Illinois. It's just south of Chicago. And this is the first set of clustered microgrids in the U.S., one of the first ones, I think. Um, and so what they did, this is a partnership between the city, the utility, ComEd, um, and Siemens. And it's what a microgrid is, is it, you can kind of put defined boundaries on it, but it can become its own um, kind of operating 
entity, right? It usually has some type of renewable energy source, plus a battery storage, plus some really smart controllers that optimize how that works. And so you, within those defined um, boundaries, can survive off the grid, if the grid goes down, business as usual, okay? Um, and so this is where they did a bunch of little clusters of these. And I always like to zoom in on this because when we talk about things that happen in other cities in Chicago, people say, oh, well, that's Chicago, we're not Chicago. Well, I mean, this is happening in like a, I think it's like a 12-block, square-block area. And if you zoom in on the map, this might not look too different than Minnesota cities or downtown areas. Um, so again, this is all scalable. These are just test sites. Um, it includes 10 facilities with critical services. So there's a health service and there's a library, um, public works building. It ties into the university, the technical university there. Um, by the time it's said and done, we're just in phase one of it right now. I think it's like two megawatts of solar um, or renewable sources plus batteries plus a lot of smart controllers that make all this happen. It's going to serve over a thousand people um, and commercial and small industrial customers. So that means if the grid goes down, these thousand people can, you know, business as usual, can keep going. They can island themselves. Now, there's also something in this for the utilities, right? Because I said it's a partnership with the city and the utility. So the utility, when it's, re it's reaching really high capacity amounts, meaning lots of people are using a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of energy, and the utility is saying, ooh, we're either going to have to charge people more for electricity and energy, or we're going to have to ask them to curtail, or I can just ask Brownville, hey, can you flip the switch and go on your microgrid for a little bit so you can alleviate some of the stress on my grid? So that's kind of a great um, new technology, emerging technology, is as far as that utility and city partnership. Um, it meets all the electricity demand for them. Um, like I said, they can operate in island mode, um, whether by choice or if they're forced into it by a natural disaster. Um, and it's also going to incorporate a lot of other city technologies, not just market technologies, but tying into EV transportation, right? How can we use these microgrids to charge? electric vehicles, right? This might be a conversation for Minnesota Met Council converting to 100% electric buses by 2022, I think it is. Well, how do you charge all those buses? Because the localized grid right now cannot handle that. So this is, these are the types of conversations that, um, you know, we're having to make all this book. Oh, and the light rail cars. I should also say both are Siemens cars, too. <laughs> How, many megawatts? How many megawatts are just the size of a In phase one, oh gosh, I've got those stats. I know in phase one it's 2.5 megawatts of renewable energy. Um, but that's just phase one, and then there's another phase which is going to incorporate a lot more than that. Was IIT, I'm familiar with them, were they driving this bus or who set this up? For, I'm sorry, for who? Um, well, Illinois is Institute of Technology, that's a big deal. But I mean, were they the ones that set this up, I assume? Um, they, are a, they are connected into the microgrid, but I believe it was a partnership between the city and the utility okay. and Siemens. So I think ComEd was a big driver um, in this, plus the city of Bronzeville, they have a lot of kind of efficiency and um, you know a lot of their vision for the future includes these types of smart technology either by necessity or by vision um, and so just having that institute of technology there I'm sure helped a lot and it was probably a very good partner within this project um, the other thing you know you can use these test cases as like living labs right so when we talk about education tying in these education programs building curriculum around it educating the future workforce because these we're gonna need people to help us manage these and build these and I don't know Bill you're really good with technology instead of all these videos. Not that good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah so they're looking at offered wind and solar, LED street lighting, 
in um, outdoor interactive digital displays for community news and emergencies, um, wayfinding. I mean, I would love it if Minneapolis and their street lights had a way to tell you which side of the road to park on during a snow emergency <laughs> because I can't, I can never figure out what is day one and day two and what side is odd and what side is even. But <laughs> I'm an architect by trade, so I need a visual. Um, and also free Wi-Fi and STEM education programs. So this is all, these are investments in our infrastructure, which aren't just like onesie twosie, right? I'm not going to buy a panel here and then not connect it to anything, right? I'm buying the panel and connecting it to building, I'm connecting it to, build, to storage, and I've got a smart controller that pushes all this around. So again, it's this whole integrated shift of systems and breaking down the silos because that's how we achieve these types of projects. Um, this is a kind of another cool one too in Brooklyn, right? The last little piece on that clip was Brooklyn, New York. Um, so they, here, this is a, it's a blockchain technology. So what happens is um, within the community, they create these microgrids of source on their buildings but there's now a blockchain technology which allows us to um, trade energy, right? So if I live in a brownstone and I've got a ton of solar on my building and it's a really, really sunny day, so I'm generating a lot of energy, but my building just doesn't need all of it, I can now sell that, my excess energy, I can sell that to my neighbor, you know, to the local library, to the office building or whatever, and that blockchain technology allows us to do that. Um, so that's another way that our cities are becoming more and more connected and we're gonna be more dependent on each other than ever. I mean, I also think about public schools, right? If you have a solar um, installation on a public school and in the summer, maybe there's not even anybody in that building. But in the summer, it's still generating all of that energy and that electricity. How can you harness that and use it elsewhere to better the rest of your community? And that happens through, you know, solar and storage and smart controllers and the ability to do that. So it's kind of a really um, neat concept of that smart city and how all this is getting integrated. Now, I said, too, I was going to touch on financing. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the very traditional ways to finance things, lease purchase, help, your own capital, operating budgets, things like that. Well, there's a new emerging um, financing thing to help, you know, move all of our communities into this space. And we call it D-Boom. It's design, build, own, operate, and maintain. And where this came out of is, um, I mean, just naturally, if you look at, okay, if you look at all the deferred maintenance that we have in our cities, and then we look at city budgets, just naturally, there's a gap there. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in deferred maintenance city budgets that are already stressed and probably declining, um, and there's just so much competing other factors for those budgets. And so in that gap, um, this D-boom financing is now available. So this is where um, it's a true public-private partnership um, in which it's typically done for on-site energy projects. And it's where somebody like Siemens would actually design and commission a project and then we also retain the ownership of that project. And then we also take over the operating and maintenance kind of burdens and risks and costs. And there's a reason for that because there's a very economical um, reason for that is because when you can combine up a tax exempt entity with someone who does pay taxes and gets a lot of tax incentives for buying things like high efficiency boilers or renewable energy, um, we can make these projects economical. So when somebody says to you, well, you know, what's the ROI on this? What's the payback? 
right? We can start having those conversations to say, no, yeah, this does pencil out. This is not only good for the energy and, you know, we're reducing our carbon emissions and we're meeting our greenhouse gas goals while we're also being, doing this in a very fiscally responsible way. Because if we can pair up, we can pass on up to 50% of a project cost onto the customer, right? So, I mean, this is, we're seeing a lot of traction with this, like a lot of hospitals, right? Does a hospital really want to own and have to operate and maintain its chiller plant? Maybe not. Maybe they want to use their capital for their business, which is providing the best healthcare possible, not operating a chiller plant. That's our type of business. And so, um, so that's where all that happened, and not just like big hospitals, but we're also um, seeing this in rural hospitals. So, uh, I mean, think about, you know, those hospitals that are out in the middle of nowhere that are, you know, if the power goes out, they're in big trouble. I mean, people could die, right? These are the types of systems and the types of partnerships that really help alleviate those risks and take that burden of things that maybe not, aren't not Really, it's their stress or business and shift it to somebody else who that is their business. So, um, if you have any more questions about that one, well, feel free to. Yeah. Uh, Laura, how does there aren't semen staff in rural areas in Minnesota, I would assume. And so, how does that operate and man maintain in those non metro areas? How does that work? Well, um, it's a good question. So part of it through all this technology is kind of remote monitoring and, and operating. So we can now do this remotely. Um, we've got a whole kind of division out of Austin, Texas, which is doing this on 24 seven and managing these types of systems. Um, but we also do have staff. I think we've got 475 employees here in Minnesota that cover every single inch um, and these people are trained to operate these types of systems. Um, now, some people will say, well, I, I just want to keep, I want to operate it. We'll say, absolutely, we will train you, right? We will invest in your education and your workforce development and train you how to do this. Um, so there's a lot of different options to, to do that. And I think it's a really good question because um, that's something that we have to work in partnership together. Are there any other questions on kind of that concept? Just one question. Yeah. There has to be a time component in this. So if you're looking out, you know, talk about savings up to 50%. I mean, what, did you push that out? Mm -hmm. I think in terms of bonds, you have to somehow, you have to come to a point where your right. bonds, you know, get over or where they a profit. So what, what sort of time frame are you talking about? So typically how that works is, so let's say if I'm going to buy a bunch of solar panels, right? Um, the cost to you to buy that might be $100. The cost to me to buy that is going to be $50. So that's the cost of the project. So I'm going to finance either $100 or I'm going to finance $50. Now, how you pay for that over time is what is that panel going to produce in electricity? And I buy the electricity or the energy from that system to pay off that $50 over time. So whether that's 15 years, whether that's 20 years, whether that's five years, it all depends on kind of the economics of that project cost versus um, the performance of that system. And so to us, that means, you know, these systems have to perform. We can't be out there just saying, oh, yeah, you're going to save 50000 you know, $500,000 in energy a year. It has, that has to happen, otherwise we don't get paid, right? So it's a way of risk sharing um, and also being able to help finance some of these projects to get over that capital burden, which I think paralyzes a lot of us, right? We look at some of these and say, oh, my God, I can't. Not only do I, do I not understand it, I don't, I don't know how to pay for it. Um, this, this is inherently created um, to overcome that. 
And Siemens um, has its own bank, um, which is neither here nor there, nor there, but it allows us to actually invest our own money into these projects. So it doesn't get sold off to some third party financer who might say yay or nay or do whatever with um, your money. It's actually held um, within the actual company that is responsible for the ownership and maintenance and performance of that system. Um, so yeah, if you have any other questions about that, feel free to let me know. But um, it's just, you know, another kind of option to put in your toolkit of options, especially when we're talking about energy systems. Um, now, the last thing I'll kind of leave you with is, um, the last example is, um, Philip was telling me Green Subsidies has some tribal organizations in it. And um, one of the kind of recent projects that we did was for a tribal uh, nation in Humboldt County in California. And this community, um, they chose to do a microgrid around their critical infrastructure, which in this case was a casino, <laughs> right? Which is important though. I mean, if the casino can't operate, the tribe can't make money. Um, similar to other types of critical infrastructures, like water systems or power plants or hospitals, right? So there, there's was the, the casino. And um, so they kind of were forced into it from a necessity standpoint and to say, how can we, how can we make sure that this operates even if the grid goes down? Because in that area, they are just prone to wildfires. I mean, we saw all the fires just kind of sweep across the landscape of California. Um, and, you know, they were right in the middle of it. But because they had invested in these kind of resilient energy infrastructures, they were able to um, operate for seven days off the grid just like normal, right? Um, so these things are being tested uh, even here in the U.S. And I think they'll continue to be tested as we have fires and floods and things. But um, yeah, so again, remember, smart cities built on smart cities and smart energy. And I'll leave you with this Blue Lake Rancheria um, example. This is like, I mean, this to me is why I absolutely love my job. <laughs> it's just to be able to do stuff like this for communities. Um, and it's, it's really important. It's my belief that this is the future and um, the way I can help make a difference. I love the land here. I love the mountains. But the earth here isn't ours. The land doesn't belong to us. It's our children and our grandchildren and the future generations ahead of us. And uh, we have an obligation to take care. Our tribe has been here since 1908. We're here. This is where we choose to be, right on this small piece of land. Our job is to take care of it not exploit it, hopefully leave it in a better shape than we found it. On this river, you can still find arrowheads on, right on the beach. They're all over. The size of the Indians living on this river is up and down the river everywhere. And that entire time, we were able to live here really in harmony with the land and without tremendous impact. One of the things we don't consciously do in teaching our children to take care of something is to come out with data. We do it by action. So when you recycle, the children see you recycle. When you go out to pick up trash along the beach or along the river and you take them with you, they learn to do it. I think that's how you pass down traditions and beliefs is by showing them and involving them. We can't be an island by ourselves, but we still have to maintain our independence in growing our own food, doing our own energy, our own fire department, and our own school, all the little aspects of any town or village. 
when we looked at energy, we had to make sure it's clean and sustainable. And this is why we've chosen to go with the microgrid. We wanted to become self-sufficient that if we lose power and the grid went down, we would still be up and running. It's very important that the rancheria is prepared for any number of scenarios. In this area, we are subject to a lot of storms, landslides, flooding, earthquakes, tsunami, you name it, we have it here. The Siemens microgrid provides what I call life, health, and safety level power. It provides cost savings and helps us shrink our carbon footprint. We really are prepared for just about anything. And the Siemens technology helps us do this. It's the cornerstone of our system. The first step in resilience is deciding to do it and become resilient. I mean, the tribe is doing it uh, because they prioritized it. We're using the sun, which has been there for us, just the same way the tribe did it in the past. Instead of doing it for food, to do it for energy. I mean, we're the caretakers of the planet for right now, right? We have a duty and a responsibility to be able to pass something that's meaningful on our kids and grandkids. That belief that you carry inside, you honor the land, and you are honoring your ancestors. I'm just here to help protect the land so my children can live here and my grandchildren will live here. We have a responsibility and obligation to make sure that it's here for them and usable and healthy.
know that, you know, I don't know if there's any like catalog list of, you know, hospitals or thinking about a plant that have, um, that have put in renewables and storage such that they really can go off the grid. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we're working on a couple um, of those types of hospital projects across the U.S. Um, and so it's kind of an exciting time to start thinking about it that way. Um, and, you, you know, and also think about like jails too, right? They're 20, also 24-7 hour operators um, and they suck a ton of energy, right? Mm -hmm. And there's usually some amount of land around them and they, they should maybe have some type of backup, right? You don't want the power going down against the jail. So that's another area where we're seeing this. Um, I mean, wastewater treatment and water treatment plants as well. The DNR in some states is requiring that you have to have backup generation. Well, instead of just looking at a, let's say, a diesel generator um, to power an entire water treatment plant, um, instead of spending $2 million, $3 million, or whatever of your own capital on that, is there a way to start thinking about, well, can I do this a little bit different? Can I somehow incorporate some renewable energy into um, battery storage? Maybe then my backup generator gets a lot smaller. And then if I can smart control all of that and tap it into my building, can I get demand savings and peak shaving? And I can offer load sharing to my utility. Um, and do I have to own that? Do I, as a city, have to own that? Um, maybe you do, right? And then maybe it's instead of deep boom, it's a deep bomb, right? <laughs> or you just you leave the ownership there, but you take the whole other concept and move forward. Um, you know, do we have to operate that? You know, these are the things that are, that are happening across the nation. Again, out of sometimes out of necessity, um, other times out of you know making having a vision of the future and saying this is how we're going to invest. Are there any other questions? Okay. You can ask questions online, both. I'll let you know. We've got some time at the end, too. So okay. Come up. Yeah. Um, now, the other thing is, is I did bring some magazines over here. These are called our Smart City magazines. Um, I think there's two versions on the table. Feel free to take those just for fun and for inspiration. It's, you know, um, dives deeper into some of these types of concepts and projects, and it has a global perspective. Um, so just know that. But there are a lot of projects um, here, kind of, you know, like the Holland, Michigan project is in one of those examples. Um, 100 resilient cities. I think they even talked about the city of Minneapolis, um, CYPP, right? This is a city performance tool. How do you look at everything that touches? City, whether it's mobility, facilities, commercial, industrial, and build a plan to get to carbon neutral by whatever your date is. Um, so yeah, I, I think those are just kind of fun. So feel free to take them. There we go. All right. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So you can make like the presenter. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit, and Dick um, Redfield is with the, the city of St. Cloud, um, and he is going to discuss their decision to um, install, to replace their lights with, with smart lights um, in the city, um, and discuss you know, some of the reasoning behind that, um, the process, and, um, and some other considerations as well. So... Can we are we able to hear him on the road? Is oh, he yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, Yay. great. Welcome. Uh, okay, um, I can't see the screen right now. Yep, Blake, uh, I just made you a presenter so you can share the PowerPoint presentation on your own computer. Uh, the one that was sent to you or my own? Yeah, that one. But you would have it on your... 
Right. You want it? You want me just to uh, bring it up on my own computer then? Yeah, yep. we and think then, that'd be easier for you to control it. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I just need to click on share here. Yep. Okay, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Yep, you see where it says screen and the controls for GoToMeeting? Okay, yep. So click there. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be doing anything here. There's a big button at the top to share your screen. You can click on that and that'll uh, allow you to share the presentation. Oh, oh wait a minute. Okay, now maybe something's happening. Okay, I'll have to bring up the uh, PowerPoint. Just a second. I, I thought you were going to be bringing it up from there. So. Sorry, we pulled a switch on you. Yeah. That's our fault. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, let's see Allie's. <laughs> let's see. Just a second. Okay. There you go, Rob. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm Blake Redfield, City of St. Cloud uh, Traffic Systems Manager, and uh, we were pretty proud of uh, this. Uh, this was actually the cover on the IMSA Journal of Little Old Downtown St. Cloud. Uh, this was in uh, March, April of 2018, showing uh, some of our uh, IntelliStreet's uh, smart lighting system. Uh, you can see the uh, video screens that we also have. Uh, it's kind of an unusual downtown. It's, it's, it's an old historic area, and they're trying to keep it that way. And uh, so we kind of had to merge the old with the new in this. And uh, so it's technology looking at it an old way. Uh, kind of a quick uh, preview of what we're going to be looking at some of the reasons for smart lighting, uh, different types of smart lighting in St. Cloud, smart lighting infrastructure, and things to consider when looking at smart lighting. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, some of the reasons for smart lighting. Why do we want to do it? And obviously, as Laura alluded to in the earlier uh, presentation, energy savings is always a big thing we're after. Uh, it's, it's always great to save energy, but it's also great to save money while you're saving energy. Dark skies compliance has become a big issue in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, put the light where you need it. Don't uh, have light shining all over the place. And then also, if you can dim down the light and not have it so bright out there at times, uh, that's uh, great for meeting dark skies compliance as well. Uh, perfect, providing correct lighting levels when it is needed. And just as with the dark skies, if there's nobody out there and uh, on the street or sidewalk or whatever, uh, why not dim those lights down during those time periods? Uh, also in buildings, and that's one of the things we're going to look at here as well. Um, we, uh, in our building here at Central Maintenance, in our hallways, we cut the lighting down to 5% uh, in, in the hallways, and you'd be amazed actually how much light there is at 5%. Security. Um, we're trying to put light where it is needed, and... Uh, not have to light areas where it's not needed. Lighting electrical power monitoring capabilities. Uh, there again, as Laura's mentioning, uh, the data that comes with smart lighting. Uh, it's really nice to know uh, what your energy usage are uh, 
in a much more complex fashion than what we've ever been able to do in the past. Uh, dimming and control capabilities, uh, as we'll see in some of our uh, systems, uh, it's, it's amazing some of the different features that you can do nowadays. And then unique lighting and specialty features, uh, especially true in our downtown and telestreet system. Uh, basically, we have about four different major types of systems that uh, we have installed that are we would consider smart lighting. Um, and our first generation would have been when we started doing updated uh, LED lighting in our project in 2010, 2011. There's no control or monitoring on the system, but uh, we have seen significant energy savings from that. Uh, a system that doesn't get talked about a lot, but it's it's called hardwire dimming. And actually we're doing that uh, within our buildings here in a lot of ways. And then these are three projects covering larger areas. Uh, St. Joseph Park and Ride, I actually designed that about four years ago. Uh, we detect when vehicles come in and out of the lot, depending on what time of night it is, it even changes what percentage of light output uh, comes from the, uh, the LED street lights that are in that parking uh, lot. Uh, in our backyard here at our St. Cloud Public Works facility, we actually are using radar detectors uh, for vehicles coming in and out of the lot, and then we're using dimming control on that. Um, we have a 33rd Street South Roadway project going on currently, and this will be a hard wire system. And but this one is just at this point in time is going to be uh, uh, by time of day we will actually throttle down how much light happens out in this area. Uh, but we may make that more sophisticated. We may put radar detectors or some sort of vehicle detection on this in the future. True wireless indoor smart systems. Uh, we have many, many buildings here that we have switched over in the last few years. Uh, the public works building here, water distribution plant, the convention center, our parking ramps. Um, it's all going to wireless control. It's a server type system. And then we uh, talk to wide area controllers. Then we have fixture control. Here again, we have power monitoring, dimming, control from smartphone or a tablet. And then we have our outdoor street lighting system. And this is in our downtown area. And there again, this is a wireless control system, uh, servers, wide area controllers. Uh, but here again, we can do some unusual things. We can actually play music through our street lights downtown. Uh, we can do announcements. We have warning beacons attached to them that could be used uh, if we wanted to say, you can't park on this side of the street because of uh, there's a snow plowing emergency or something, we could bring up different colored lights on these warning beacons. Uh, they have security cameras in them. Uh, the video screens, as you saw on that earlier picture, it's in front of you now too. Uh, we're dimming these lights after a certain time at night. And uh, these can be controlled from either a smartphone or a tablet. Uh, this, like I say, was kind of our first project that we did back in 2011, 2012. And our main goal here was we wanted new decorative lighting, uh, primarily to reduce maintenance, but also to reduce electrical costs. Uh, the uh, previous fixtures were kind of a poor quality fixture, and it was a real nasty high pressure sodium and just didn't like the area well at all. Uh, we went from twin fixtures, and you can see in this picture here now, we've just converted them down to single fixtures. So we reduced maintenance in uh, two different ways. Uh, it was kind of a, back in 2010, 2011, it was still kind of the wild west of uh, LED lighting. And I was not happy with a lot of the test results and photometrics and things we were getting from the manufacturers. And so we actually have put together our own lighting lab here that we can uh, test photometrics, we can do spectral analysis on lighting, we can do color rendering index, 
Uh, we can do just about every test that they do at the factories now. And uh, we, uh, we learned a lot of things. And uh, we, we tested a lot of different light fixtures before we really found what we were happy with. Uh, the fixtures that we've chosen have become citywide standards because of quality of the fixture and product support. Significant energy savings and maintenance savings on these fixtures. And the crazy thing about the whole thing, our greatest maintenance on this set of fixtures is replacement when these get hit by vehicles. Our primary smart lighting control system for our, we had a major LED lighting project in 2016, 2017, where we basically replaced 99% of all of our street lights in uh, St. Cloud with LED lighting. Um, I looked at a lot of different uh, systems. The problem with most systems is they're just that, they're systems, and they're typically good for about 10 years, and then you end up replacing them with something else. I wanted to look at something that uh, was going to have about a 40-year lifespan and, and that it could be uh, revamped in the future if we wanted to. And so we actually developed a whole new generation of lighting cabinet that uh, we have used uh, throughout the city here. Uh, it incorporates zero crossing solid state relays for reduced surges to the lighting circuits. Use a staggered circuit turn on to reduce electrical stresses. Uh, the PLC in it allows for external inputs and outputs for special functions such as hardware, hardwire dimming, talked about a little bit earlier. Extensive surge protection incorporated into the new uh, lighting cabinets. Uh, the P PLC provides hours of operation. We actually know how many hours that the lights have been on each year and then we record that. And then also there's a cooling fan in these cabinets. We record how many hours of operation those have run during the year. And then also we developed a little product you can see in the lower right-hand corner of your screen there called a soft start module. And that slowly turns on the light fixtures rather than the instant on that LEDs uh, are, are known for. And this uh, reduces the surges and uh, is going to extend the life of the cabinets or, or, or the fixtures and the cabinets and everything out there. Uh, we have more than 40 of these uh, cabinets on the street now and, uh, and zero failures out of them. Uh, very happy with uh, this product. And uh, here's a little bit larger uh, photo of this new generation cabinet on the far right. And uh, you can see the, uh, the little soft start modules in the upper left. If you look at that uh, picture in the middle, upper, uh, in the center there, you'll see those spikes on the leading edge of those square waves. And that's current spikes that are created when you turn off and on an LED fixture. And uh, by using our soft start module, and a zero crossing contactor, if you look at that uh, picture down in the lower left, that is what we have reduced the spikes to. They're virtually non-existent. And then when we have the staggered turn-ons, that graph that's in the middle, in the center there on the lower, uh, that's what the current looks like as light fixtures ramp up on a system uh, in one of these cabinets. And then we turn them off in a staggered fashion as well. Hardwire dimming control, as noted uh, earlier, this is what we're doing uh, in several places, including our back lot here at Central Maintenance. And uh, we actually are using microwave radar detectors like they used to use. These were just surplus devices we had in our inventory. Uh, we typically don't use them anymore. It's all video now on our traffic signals. And so we, we had these in stock. Uh, they, they've worked out great for this application, but if there's no uh, traffic back here for like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I don't remember what it is now, uh, it will uh, ramp these up to 100% when a vehicle is detected. 
drop them back down to around 10% when there's no vehicles out there. Uh, the zero to 10 volt DC dimming control, which LED fixtures come with now has been a, a real godsend for us and ways that we can uh, work with them and control them like we've never been able to do before. Uh, the, the nice thing also, this is a low initial cost there's really no system to deal with or to maintain. And it's been a great energy saver back here too, because these are fairly large fixtures. Uh, even an LED, they're 300 watts each. There's four of them on each pole. Uh, when we throttle them back, they're like 30 watts each. This is our IntelliStreets lighting program or project that we did in downtown St. Cloud. Uh, we wanted to do decorative lighting. It's a little bit different than the one shown here, but it's similar idea. These are programmable in ways that we still we're still working on trying to figure out all the different things it can do. But they're they're really quite amazing for dimming, and uh, you can even special order these. That uh, if you want a special celebration going down in your downtown area, you could have. Uh, red light or green light or yellow light or whatever colored light you actually wanted coming out of it. We don't have that capability on ours, but it is available. Uh, turn on and turn off times. Uh, you can do several different things. Uh, we're actually uh, using, um, oh, uh, the term slips me right at the moment, but uh, by the uh, actual daylight time that we have in our area here. Uh, dimming by time of day, after a certain time at night, we dim these fixtures down. Uh, music and special announcement capabilities, and uh, they come from this area right in here. Emergency beacon fixture, this little white area up in here is a beacon that can be yellow, blue, red, green, of uh, almost any color that you can imagine that uh, you could set up for uh, special meaning for your downtown area. You can also strobe these in a sequential manner. So if you had them and like if you needed the emergency evacuation out of your convention center or something, you could strobe the things to show people what direction to head out of your downtown area or whatever area that you're uh, trying to get people evacuated from. Uh, we have also put security cameras on these. Now they're showing a real small security camera here. We've actually gone with a larger one uh, that isn't quite as uh, small as what this one is, but it, they have better capabilities. And then the video panels, uh, which uh, we can program to do still shots, uh, we can do video on them, uh, a number of different things. Communications infrastructure for the IntelliStreets lighting, like we were just looking at there, it's a cloud-based system, and that's where the main communication is. We have to have an interconnection uh, with high speed, and then we have fiber out onto the street, and then we control them uh, or we connect to them through a gateway system, uh, which talks to the individual poles that are out there on the street. Uh, you can control it from an iPad, a smartphone, a computer, your personal computer. Typically, I use the personal computer. It just is easier to work with. Uh, but they have all sorts of different uh, ways you can actually uh, talk to these things. And I guess you kind of, yeah, the gateways, you have to have multiple gateways uh, in your downtown area or the area it's going to be in. Uh, yeah, we pretty much cover those. Oh, yeah, and then you can create districts. That was one thing, so that uh, you can aggregate these things in whichever way you want to. Uh, and so if you want one area of town playing a certain type of music and another area of town playing another kind of music, you can do that. 
and they all synchronize with each other, the ones that are playing music uh, of the same sort, so that they, uh, it doesn't sound like one's ahead of the other. It, it's really pretty amazing how that they all work that out. Uh, in our building smart lighting, we've gone to the Dane Tree system, uh, which was originally developed in Australia. And uh, it, we've, we've had a very, very successful uh, time with this. Uh, here again, the infrastructure, it, it's interesting because when you start looking at these systems, the infrastructure becomes very, very similar from one lighting system to another. Uh, here again, it's a cloud-based server system. Uh, lighting devices are controlled by groups or individual connections. So if you want a, uh, if you want a very granular type uh, system, you can have a control device on every single light fixture or you could have like if you had a strip or a line of light fixtures, eight or 10 light fixtures in a row that you all want to control with just one unit, you can do that as well. Um, occupancy lighting units and other sensors connect to the wide area controller. They call it a WAC here. A uh, little bit different terminology, kind of the same infrastructure as our other system. Here again, uh, other systems or devices such as heating, cooling, alarms, all can be integrated into these systems. Here's one of the things that's really cool with uh, with the Daintree system is that it's it's very user friendly, and it gives you some very very good visuals. Here it's showing if if we were not running controls on these groups of lighting, this is what our electrical costs would be for those months, if you look down there. But by using electric, uh, the control system, we have reduced to this blue line here uh, within the facility here. Uh, here's in a parking ramp where we're using this system. And I'm gonna have to hide this thing for right now. Anyway, uh, like here we're showing the differences in uh, which uh, ramp levels by month. So if we want to compare uh, January to March, we can just look and see by time of day how much more energy it took uh, throughout this time period. And then, if we want to get real in depth, uh, here's even on our different parking levels. Uh, we, we find out which level of our parking ramps are using the most energy. So like here, our roof parking level five is using much more energy with the lighting up there than what the other levels are in the different groups that we have. So very, very in depth. Uh, information and, and just very, very data rich in, in what you can get out of out of these systems. Here's just some uh, quick uh, considerations when you know looking at smart lighting systems. Uh, look at high level engineering first. You know, look at the what question. Don't look at the how question. Look at the what question. Determine the main purpose for installing your smart lighting systems. What do I want to do? Review the licensing and cloud service costs. Uh, there's none of these systems that are free. They're all going to cost you something uh, in long and short-term short uh, costs. Uh, the system will require significant support staff and expertise. You have to have people in your group, in your work group, that are gonna be able to maintain and set these systems up. And they are fairly complex. It's, it, there's a definite learning curve to these things. Uh, you have to have a good supporting IT infrastructure. We are fortunate here in St. Cloud. We have an excellent IT department and with some excellent uh, fiber and support people that, that can really help us out on some of these technical things. And the system grow into the future uh, as future technologies and devices come online. Uh, what, what is the project cost going to be? Uh, use reputable products. Don't just use something that Joe Blow came up with in his garage and said, hey, this is really cool. 
I think you could use this on a large scale project. Uh, you, you really need to use reputable vendors of products. Uh, use contractors that have the expertise to install these systems. And sometimes contractors have to hire subcontractors because a lot of electrical contractors are not fiber contractors. So uh, just make sure you have people that know what they're doing when they install these systems. Uh, have support agreements in place. Uh, make sure that the company can actually support this product uh, in, in whatever fashion you need that support. Check the warranty and commissioning. Uh, commissioning is a big thing on any of these smart systems. They have to be commissioned. That means setting them up, making sure they're working the way you want them to, connecting this to that, make, making sure that uh, you know, you're, you're getting out of it what you want out of it. Uh, and sometimes energy savings may not exceed the maintenance and support costs. And that's one of the things you have to really seriously look at on the long, long term with these things too. That was one of the reasons that we went to the, the cabinet system that we have for a mainstay of our lighting out on the street is because I did not want to every 10 years be out there replacing some kind of a system. That gets very expensive and it's very uh, labor intensive. And uh, so for us, we wanted a simpler technology for that. And then is your project engineer up to this challenge? Make sure you have a project engineer that can do the project. And then one that I didn't put on here, and that is training for the people that are gonna be using it. And that's very, very critical. And here's just a couple of little specialty lighting systems that we've done in St. Cloud that kind of go even beyond the smart lighting. Uh, these are, uh, uh, decorative lighting that we have done on one of our water towers and then on what we call the Lincoln Plaza in uh, downtown St. Cloud. So thanks for bearing with me and uh, any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, Blake, can, have you had any problem with locating or having your system hit? Uh, or disruptions from that uh, sector? Uh, hit, you mean by vehicles? No, I mean underground. I mean, just... Uh, oh, or strikes? strikes. Yeah, uh, yeah, there, yeah, there's always that chance. You know, there again, we have our own locating staff here. We're making sure that when uh, something's going on, uh, you know, the locates are getting called in and we're out marking it. Uh, a question, Blake. So, were demand charges decreased? Did, were you seeing demand charges that could be shaved off through uh, installation, successive installation of, of segments of, of light poles? Demand charges in which sense? Electricity. Um, did you have these little spikes that were showing up as monthly demand charges from your utility? that you were able to decrease? Well, yeah, and one of the things that was kind of complex for us is we had a lot of flat rate lighting here in St. Cloud. Oh. And, and we, we did away with, uh, I think we have four or five light fixtures that are still on flat rate. Uh, otherwise, everything has been switched over to metered lighting here. So I, it's it's a little bit hard to answer that question because it, it, we're comparing apples and oranges here. Yeah. Blake, this is Ben Wallace. I'm just curious what you found to be the most valuable or intriguing application from a communication standpoint. And have you had a chance to use the strobing for directing traffic or any of the audio aspects aside from music? Just curious if there were any kind of anything that really stands out. Um, the, the video screens are, are a big thing for us. Uh, we have them going all the time with the information on them about downtown St. Cloud and things like that. Uh, the music, uh, I was a little surprised uh, I actually had kind of some negative 
feedback on the music because oh no, no matter what you try to put out there somebody hates it <laughs> 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 but uh yeah uh, communication out there you know i we only do the music for maybe a half a dozen times a year now just because of kind of the like we had the Veterans Day parade, so we were playing patriotic music there and you know stuff like that. But we, we certainly don't do it on an ongoing basis. Um, I guess going back to 2010, 11. I mean, who, where did the direction come from to start looking into smart lighting, um, and then how did it evolve from sort of standard? LED switch out into these these lights with more capabilities. Um, well, like was it staff or did the elected officials or who who kind of pushed it? Well, it was kind of a combination of uh, uh, I guess the upper level management uh, was kind of pushing us to to do something with LED lighting. Um, I was trying to stay on top of it the best I could. And for several years, uh, I was kind of holding back because there was a lot of really bad LED lighting out there when it first came on the market. And it was finally in about that 2010, 2011, 2012 range when finally we started seeing some decent LED lighting coming onto the market. Uh, but it was, uh, what did they call that? The recovery, ARRA, was that uh, the- Yeah, the, recovery? Yep. yeah. Uh, they actually paid for that first LED project. And uh, those fixtures are, are actually quite expensive. And so for us to ever really pay for them just from a pure energy saving standpoint, wasn't going to happen. But uh, with the ARRA funds, uh, then it uh, made it very attractive to us to, to do something like that. And then from that point on, uh, there were just a lot of things that were happening in the technology and that we could see that, hey, there's a lot more things that we can do than just uh, turn a light off and on. Perfect. We do have a question um, from the web. Uh, how many total fixtures do you have um, and are traffic lights included or is that just street lights? And then I'm gonna tag onto that. Does the city own all of these or are there some that are owned by the utility? The city owns approximately half the street lights in St. Cloud uh, right now. And I mean, we're small potatoes, I realize, compared to a lot of the big cities. Uh, I think we have about 2,500 street light fixtures and the power company has right at 2,500 street light fixtures in town. Does that include the traffic lights? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, traffic signals, uh, I think we have, there again, about Oh, what did I figure out the other day? About 1,800 different displays on traffic signals. Now, we did actually change all of those out uh, in the 2016-2017 LED lighting project because a lot of them had been put in 15 years prior. Uh, LED had actually uh, been pretty prevalent in the traffic signal world for, oh, 15, 18 years. Well, the problem is most of those didn't meet the new ITE standards and the new ones take about half the power than what the old ones did. Um, I'll ask one more question. My back is sort of to the oh, audience, yeah. so I'm gonna so, one more on the same. Okay, okay so, yeah. uh, so street street, uh, street light dimming. So do you go down to twenty percent or ten percent? No, 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 no. In in buildings, we will do that, but uh, out on the street. Uh, we will typically only do down to about 50% in that neighborhood. Now, in parking lots, and, and, and there again, in parking ramps and some of those areas, uh, it, it varies a lot in what we will do. In parking ramps, I think we go down to about 30% on the low end. Uh, in buildings, like I say, we'll actually go down to 5%, like in our hallways and our buildings. Uh, and it's amazing, actually, how much light there is at 5%. So it's it's one of those things you kind of have to play with and and also IES is is going to be coming out with new standards I'm sure in a lot of these areas uh, that can kind of help out with that now in our parking ramps 
Uh, we have every other light fixture actually has a sensor in them to sense for pedestrians or vehicles. So uh, if there's anybody up there walking around, it's going to bring them up to that 100% range in just a matter of a few seconds. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, I know you talked about the wild, wild west of LED back in the early 2010s, which was a real thing. I've been, I was in the lighting industry at that time, and it is, you got a lot of people that were making stuff out of their trunk and trying to sell it to, you know, cities and government officials, but I just want you guys to be aware that this is kind of where the IOT is right now, too. There's a lot of people out there that are trying to get to this technology so they can make a six bucks. So before you invest in smart lighting or any IOT infrastructure in your city, Make sure that you do research on that company and see how long they've been around because if they've been around for the last five years, I've brought that But there are a lot of companies who are out there trying to capture that right now. Um, I want to go back real quick to the ownership. So obviously you can do this with your own. Do you wish you could do it with? I think you have Excel out there. Um, or do you, does that structure work out okay for the city as well? Well, actually, uh, the power company has updated most of their street lights here, and they actually went with the same brand that we did. So uh, we have actually fairly consistent street lighting here under the Excel area. Our problem is we actually have four different energy companies here in the St. Cloud area. So it gets a little bit confusing at times <laughs> as to who's doing what. Um, Blake, you mentioned your city lighting lab. Uh, is that something that you'd be open to other cities if they want to test out something that they could maybe stop on over and 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 use your lab for and your? Oh, uh, absolutely. That actually, that's one of the reasons we have it uh, is is a training center, and uh, we've had people from all over the country actually that have been here to look at our setup. Nice. Well, maybe, uh, yeah, that's actually a good segue. Um, I'm going to take this back, right? Well, can I just do this? Yeah, just by getting it out. Okay. <laughs> um, so that would be, we, we um, like last year we took uh, Green Set Cities on the road and actually we went to St. Cloud, so maybe it's like every other year we don't go to St. Cloud. Um, yeah. We did our workshop at the St. Cloud Wastewater Treatment Facility um, where they've done incredible work on efficiency, um, capturing some of the gas off the system, um, integrating solar, participating in community solar gardens. Um, I think they're saving something over $700,000 a year on on energy costs there, and it's just it's incredible work on their wastewater treatment facility. Um, so we did that last year, and then if we go all the way to the end mm -hmm. of this one, sure um, uh, our our field trip workshop will be in Red Wing um, May 1st, so May Day. Um, we'll be going down to uh, Red Wing to learn about the the solar that's been happening there. Um, they have a really cool uh, community solar garden. Um, uh, that uh, I guess we've you've done tours of before, and so um, we'll do that, and maybe next year we'll do um, a lighting lab. A lighting lab. Yeah. I'll be like, oh, we'll go back to St. Cloud. Paula, do you want to say a couple of words about? Yeah, this is going to be uh, interesting. Uh, Red Wing has been involved, has had a sustainability commission for over 10 years, and uh, our projects are. are uh, are pretty well accepted. 86% uh, of the public wanted to see sustainability considered in all uh, city policy. The very last so one. Good support from the community. You also installed the first uh, municipally owned uh, level three charging station in Minnesota, which uh, we will include in the tour. So uh, it should be interesting. There's there's a great deal of uh, history involved from our uh, the power plant and a former uh, alternative energy school. So uh, good thing, and we welcome everybody. Red Wing's a nice place to come, and as we say now, you can see the river and the future from Red Wing. So <laughs> please join us, and uh, it'll be worth your while. Nice. Um, so there there is the information for the for the next workshop that will be in Red Wing. So Blake,
Thank you so much. That was um, I just, I think like this incredibly fascinating and there's so much that we can do with them. And so it's really exciting to see St. Cloud um, starting up a lab and testing it and looking at all these different options, um, making that available to other folks as well. And um, just thinking about it, I control several lights with my own phone. My house, so it's great. Um, you know, you can do so many different things. I think that there's just an abundance of technology out there that we can take advantage of. Um, uh, and, and just make it work for us. Um, so, yeah, well, uh, Abby, will the May workshop in Red Wing be a webinar too, or is it just in person? I think it will, I mean, we'll let you know. It will probably primarily be in person, but we could probably do the presentation portion of it via webinar. But we need to work out the logistics on that. Um, but I would strongly encourage those who can attend to attend. Uh, it sounds like you also have electric vehicle charging there, so if you can uh, make the trip to to Red Ring, there's there's some charging available to get home. Um, so with that, thanks everybody for having. Thanks to everybody who's on the internet and, and and stuck with us till 11, and we'll see you in May.